Okay, well, um, on behalf of the Center for Communication and Medicine, I'd like to welcome you to a Speak Sooner webinar. Surviving illness, challenges of living fully in the time of COVID. I'm Bernard Bandman, Executive Director of the Center, and I will be your moderator. We're living in a time of worry and hope because COVID has impacted all of our lives. And it's been a challenge to navigate a return to normal life, especially for those who have faced or are facing serious illness. Many of us are impatient to get on with life after going, undergoing debilitating treatments and having a compromised immune system and having to isolate to prevent contracting COVID. Many of us have followed CDC guidelines to act safely and been vaccinated. Others may be questioning masking and social distancing and hesitant to be vaccinated based upon their beliefs about its safety or other reasons. But as we know, those who are unvaccinated present risks for those who are immune compromised. So it's our intent to address some of these very timely issues by hearing from those who've had firsthand experience in facing illness and healthcare professionals who care for them. So now I'd like to do, like to do is to introduce you to the panel. Okay, panelists, Sarah Ames. Sarah is an oncology certified nurse practitioner at Adirondack Health Cancer Center in Saranac Lake, New York. She has over 18 years experience working in the field of cancer care as a registered nurse, nurse practitioner and program director. Sarah subspecializes in cancer genetic risk assessment and palliative care. Colonel James Baker served as the Vermont, for in the, with the Vermont State Police for over 30 years and was director from 2006 to 2009 before working as an independent consultant for numerous federal law enforcement agencies. He has been the project lead of the Arlington Vermont Area Renewal Project and offers services in leadership coaching, first responder safety, wellness and law enforcement executive searches. He currently serves as the interim commissioner of the Vermont Department of Corrections. Colonel Baker is a cancer survivor. Dr. Al Yareev is medical director of United Counseling Service and a psychiatric consultant at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, both in Bennington, Vermont. She is a professor emeritus of psychiatry at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque and is the author of and contributed to numerous medical papers and publications. Tom Restino is Vice President of Operations for the Paula Auto Group in New York and serves as Town and Village Justice for the Town of Hoosick, New York and the Village of Hoosick Falls, New York. He's Chairman of the Eastern New York Coalition of Automotive Retailers and a graduate of NADA Dealer Academy. He and his wife, Margaret, have three children. Tom is a COVID survivor. So what I'd like to remind you is that you can submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I will do my best to uh, ask as many of them as time allows. Prior to the webinar, um, I asked our panel to briefly describe the greatest challenge in living fully in the time of COVID. This is what they had to say. In a word, can you describe the greatest challenge of living fully in this time of COVID? Confined. Sickness. Condition. Worry. And you take the risk to avoid getting sick. And so um, I wish that wasn't like that. I didn't have to think about it. I can be more spontaneous. But you can't be spontaneous because you've got to be careful about 
not getting sick on the heels of dealing with cancer. We try to navigate uh, their priorities uh, in the context of more limitations. What are we living differently? It just watching what you do. How much can you do differently? Because I thought I was doing the right thing before I got sick. So you don't know. Often we think of stress reduction as going and doing something fun or getting our minds off of something for a while. And in fact, that doesn't really reduce this kind of pervasive, unending stress. I feel like th there is some value um, in what we've been through um, because it makes you think about life and what's important. I think people are really making uh, sound decisions and they are more uh, used to having to make these adjustments because they don't feel well or they are immunocompromised. That's not new to them. Across disciplines, religions, and cultures, spiritual practices, meaningful connection, often called family, but it can be the family of choice, not just your biological family of origin, and interactions with the natural world come up as universal themes for reducing stress and increasing meaning in living. I don't live my life on wishes. I just live it the way I want to live it. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is um, to ask the panel some questions. And um, I'd like to uh, begin with uh, Colonel Baker. Uh, so can you expand on what you said in the video and tell us about your health condition and what it's like facing the challenges of resuming a normal life in this time of COVID? Yeah, cert certainly, Bernie. Um, look, I was diagnosed on, on December 6, 2017 with renal cancer. Uh, I had a softball-sized tumor on my left, left kidney. And uh, on the 21st of December, 15 days later, I was operated on at Sloan Kettering in New York where my kidney and the tumor was removed. Uh, the cancer had metastasized to my lungs, in particular, my right lung. And uh, there were uh, numerous lesions on my lungs, but there were three um, that um, they needed to deal with. I went into a trial uh, at Sloan that lasted almost two years, which helped contain and shrink the lesions. Um, but, um, you know, we traveled back and forth um, three times every three weeks to New York to do that. And um, this was prior to COVID, um, but I'm dealing with, I was dealing with those lesions, which um, more than likely we knew were cancerous and they were trying to contain them. Um, and then um, I, I had a, a, a very, significant reaction to the trial right around the time COVID began. And uh, I, I had to deal with infusions, IVIG infusions to deal with the, uh, my immune system attacking itself. And, uh, you, know, you know, that was right at the beginning of COVID. And it, it was a struggle trying to just even go into the hospital to get the infusions. Um, and then I'll fast forward, you know, in the middle of, of COVID, um, this past summer, um, I was getting CAT scans every eight weeks and then every 12 weeks. And a CAT scan that I got in May determined that two of the three significant lesions had started to grow. And uh, that required me to go through two ablation procedures this summer in the middle of COVID in New York without being able to have family around me. And I had significant um, I had a significant reaction to the first ablation to include a uh, collapse of a lung and some, some twice and some very serious damage as a result of that. And so in the middle of this, you know, you're dealing with COVID, you're trying to figure out how to stay safe. You, you know, you don't, you don't want to be put in a position where you get exposed to, to COVID because again, the, the disease being what it is, the virus, affects the lungs and I'm dealing with my lungs. And so it really, 
this summer, the uh, the two ablations really, I, I was in pretty good state of mind up until that happened. And COVID, that combined with COVID really caused me um, to, to realize I'm, I'm, I'm still a cancer patient. I mean, I still have a lesion on my lungs that we now know as a result of the biopsies from the ablation is cancer. And I'm a cancer patient. And I have to deal with that when I think about and when, when I when, when we make decisions about where are you going on vacation? Should we go to a concert? Can we eat dinner inside? These are all things that at this point in my, my life that I look forward to with my wife that, that I, I, I can't do in many cases and I have to think about it. And you have to measure uh, the risk of what you're deciding to do against what you know your medical situation is. And you have to make those decisions. And I wish I could be more spontaneous, but you can't be. So it, it is challenging. And so I know other folks that are dealing with cancer understand exactly what I'm saying. Yes, it's challenging is back to the, the topic of, of this particular webinar um, in terms of being able to move forward with your life and you're constantly having to be vigilant. And we'll mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about that a little bit later in the webinar. I'd like to turn to Tom um, because you were very seriously ill and hospitalized with COVID. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? And also, could you tell us about what has been most challenging about moving forward with living more fully? Um, I was started, I became sick the 22nd of September and I went home and I thought it was just a, maybe, you know, a cold or something. And I received that Friday notice that I had COVID. So now we're into it for a few days. And then I go to um, Bennington to get, you know, cause I'm sick. I got to run in a temperature and constantly run in a temperature. And I go to the emergency room to figure out what I have. They give me some steroids. They send me back home. He says, you might get better. You should get better. Now we're into Wednesday and I'm not getting better. And it's Thursday morning, October 1st. And it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm laying in bed going, am I really that sick that I want to bother someone to come get me? And I've never called 911. So I proceed to call 911. And I wait downstairs with my wife for the ambulance to show up. The EMT shows up and they bring me to Albany Med. Now, at that point, I'm going to Albany Med and I'm running 104 temperature. I'm thinking, well, we're going to get through this whole thing. It's not nothing to worry about because... As you well know, my wife is a Alzheimer's patient. And on Friday, she was, you know, just the whole process with it that I got to get better. So they bring me to Albany Med. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday morning. They rush me up to the um, intensive care. It's closed room and they, they have to wear airbags to get in to see me. And, and they put me on 50 liters of oxygen because they because th I can't breathe. Allegedly, I think I'm feeling all right. And. And I'm in the hospital, I'm in the bed. And I said to the nurse, because I knew I needed to keep moving. I had to keep my senses about myself. And you and I've talked about this, Bernie, about healthcare, what I want to do. And I wanted to keep moving. And I said to the nurse, and he wasn't my nurse. I said, I got to get out of this bed. I want to go sit in that chair. He says, if you're my patient, you're not getting up. I says, well, I'm going to get up. Because I got, I'm thinking I got to keep my lungs moving because I know there's something wrong. So they, they get me up and running. And, and, and the funny thing about it, Timmy comes down and sees me on Sunday. And I was, when I first went to the ICU, they said, they want to put a catheter in me. I went, catheter? I work out all the time. I'm boxing. My lungs are great. You, you guys don't know. I mean, you're not putting no catheter in me. And then Timmy shows up and he's talking. He, he doesn't want to go in because the whole house was affected. And they finally said I was a heartbeat away from a catheter or not the catheter but the the ventilator and i'm thinking to myself ventilator that i'm gonna die i can't communicate with my home and throughout this whole process i'm thinking and i'm trying to still do business and i'm sick and i got this oxygen going in me my daughter's watching me and you know taking care of it and i and i get a call from the county sheriff on, on wednesday and he says tommy you got some problems at the dealership now we have 400 employees i'm thinking oh what's going on well, they want to shut the dealership down for eight. They want to shut the dealership down because COVID's attacked it. And I'm going, and at that point, the dealership shut me down. They said, you're sick. You can't communicate with anybody. 
So we went through, I finally was released from, and I had infectious disease doctors and they're all coming in and seeing me and I'm making conversation with them because I wanted to keep moving. And I'm trying to do exercises because I'm so afraid about my lungs because I had double pneumonia. And at that point, they're saying, you're sick. No, I'm not going to be that sick. I'm going to get better. I'm going to get better. And they gave me a, a five-day drip. Uh, it wasn't re Regeneron. It was a, a, another piece that they gave me. And I started feeling better. And they released me to uh, the regular room. So they moved me down to my regular room. And I, and I filmed a, a video of me leaving. And that's what things you do. So you remember things. And I listened to my voice. I didn't know who, who was talking on that. I didn't know how bad it was. And so they released me on um, October 15th and I went, oh, I'm going to get better. Cause you think you're really rejuvenated until you get up and you, you can't move. But October 1st, I go home and or 15th, I go home. It's Margaret's birthday. The next day I go out for a walk and I walk, Jim will know it. I start walking up classic street and I have my little monitor on and I'm watching my oxygen. That was the big thing. And it dropped to 75%. I went, uh Oh, so I just, you just had to work yourself back into it. And I just wanted to push myself to get better. I needed to get better because I needed to take care of my family. And when I say that, you, you don't stop. Yeah. You don't stop. But when, when you recovered, I made sure that I do not want to have a relapse. I, when I went back to work, I started working out to the fullest. I knew I needed to get my lungs conditioned. I knew my lungs were spotted. And I knew I needed to speak to a pulmonologist to make sure I was cleared. And he made me wait my 60 days for that. And I went back, did my breathing test and passed that within, you know, minutes. And it was supposed to be an hour and a half test, this, this actually this a breathing test. And I passed it in minutes. So I had to wait around, saw the, the, the nice doctor, which cleared me and said, I had fixed my scars that, that came from this. And what do I do in life now? I said, when you asked me about what a wish was, a wish is unattainable. And if you condition yourself, and I keep on saying that, if I condition myself and I watch what I do and I exercise as much as I possibly can and take my, my vitamins and keep my head clear, I still have a responsibility to my family. So that's my biggest purpose in life is to get through this and condition myself to do it. And there, there's no hope, there's no wishing for anything. It's proven it and conditioning. So that's, that's what, what you're, you're talking about. That's what drives you the challenge. Yeah. You're, you, you said your family, you'll, you'll do whatever you need to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, you made it through yeah. from the hospitalization. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll talk a little bit more about that later in terms okay. of some of the challenges. Um, I wanted to ask Sarah, because Sarah is an oncology nurse practitioner. Um, and you talk to patients all the time, Sarah. Uh, who are in active treatment and also survivors that are doing follow-up visits with you uh, about moving on with their lives. Uh, and you made a comment uh, in the video about observing patients making sound decisions about life activities in this particular time of COVID. So can you elaborate on the issues that you find yourself addressing in these conversations with patients? I can. I just want the viewers to know, too, that I live in a rural area, which um, changes how COVID has impacted uh, our community. It hasn't been like it's been in the urban areas. But when I thought about this question, I realized that on a day to day basis, dealing with individuals with cancer is that it's wrought with uncertainty. And we're constantly having conversations about risks and benefits and what defines our quality of life. And I find that it's a big part of my role is to help work through uh, weighing those risks with as much evidence as we can provide and hoping that they can achieve uh, their goals. So that's a normal part of my day-to-day -day work. COVID has been a very complicated layer to that. But I, from my experience, as a whole, I have been very impressed with how my patient population has navigated COVID. I mean, they are actually more expert at dealing with uncertainty and limitations than I am. So I think it's been more of a conversation and not necessarily like me telling them, you know, this is how you need to do things. So I think that um, 
in a way, COVID has made some decision making a little bit more clear because the risk for some is so clear that they're not going to take that risk. I mean, this is life or death for these individuals. So depending on where you stand, COVID has a different relationship with you. So I've learned a lot from that. And the other point I wanted to make that living in this environment where it's rural and we have mountains and lakes and, you know, people really have embraced being outside and we've been able to socialize a little bit more easily because of the environment we live in. So it hasn't felt as claustrophobic as maybe it has for other, other individuals. Yeah, you're talking about um, and, and really relying on the patient's self-knowledge, you know, what they understand. You can offer uh, you know, information about the risks, the benefits of, of, of doing certain things, but that it really strikes me how much in your, what you just said is that you really look to the patient to help you understand what really matters to them. Right. And then you can take that and then have a conversation specifically about right. okay, what does this present for risk. Right. And risk of infection is one of the number one concerns for cancer patients, period. So COVID, you know, is another contagious situation that they are familiar with having to take those precautions. So it's, it's not a new concept is what I'm saying. And um, when it's not a new concept, there's lots, lots to learn from that. Now I'd like to ask Dr. Reeve, okay? Um, and so in your- know. <laughs> to everything that was said. <laughs> okay, you know, gotcha, right, exactly, oh boy. Um, <clears throat> we have, it's, it's astounding how much we learn in, in this very condensed amount of time. Um, so in your work as a psychiatrist, you care for patients with mental health problems. So can you tell us what you found to be the lingering psychological symptoms that have resulted from the threat of COVID, okay? And then I have a follow-up question uh, about, well, I'll ask you that first before I ask you about patients living with serious illness. So for many people with chronic mental illness, suddenly it went beyond their usual habits of coping to being aware that there was a very real external threat to their survival. And depending on what kind of a disorder and what kind of a habit of living you have, you had a very different response. So I do, for example, remember very clearly a young female adult uh, who rather delighted in the fact that her social phobia and her tendency to stay at home and not leave her house except under huge psychological effort said with great glee, well, I'm really normal now. It's wonderful. They're all doing what I've been doing. And I can reach school or classes much more easily because they're ready for us now her concerns came up as we opened up last spring. So we're talking the spring of 21, not the spring of 20, um, becoming much more concerned with how would she negotiate having to go back into public more often. Other people with chronic psychotic illness who have a great deal of difficulty verifying that the person on the video is different or more real than the person on the TV who have auditory or visual hallucinations or thought insertion struggle a great deal when they are having communications with people that they do not previously know. So some of them would do fine with case managers or therapists or prescribers that they had an existing relationship with, but not with new people. And they felt exceedingly isolated that they could not get together for coffee with other people or get together and experience their groups where they were in the same room. 
some of the things that we did to mitigate that at UCS meant that we kept services going at almost the same level, although not completely, but all the essential clinical services was using outside areas like a tent for larger groups, doing a combination of in-person and video in the same group. So a person who couldn't travel or who had quarantine restrictions or didn't have a way to come safely could participate in a group while two others were in person with the therapist or the therapist might be by video and two people in the room and another person online. Um, that kind of combinations of in-person and telehealth um, were very important. Another piece related to this was uh, the outreach to doing assessments in the community of therapists and case managers working with children coming and making contact on porches and outside. Sarah was talking about being in a rural area. Bennington County is a mix of some people living in apartments in close proximity with each other and other people very disparate and having no Wi-Fi to do make any contact. So sometimes it was providing activities for appropriate, appropriate to kids' ages that they could engage in and seeing them and conducting sessions from a porch or in a front yard or going for a walk down the road. Let, let me ask you this because, and then this, I'm gonna ask you, but specifically- Everybody else too. Because of your expertise, but it's a question that actually I, um, I heard a number of times from those submitted. Mm -hmm. With the registration, and it, it the question has to do with anxiety, and there was you know there are some people who said you know I'm I'm more anxious about the fact that um, I'm so isolated, I I not really um, kept up relationships, um, I feel this sense of not belonging and and feeling really uncomfortable about that, anxious about that, and then there's there are other questions which is just, just like this other side of the coin, which is that, you know, I'm feeling so anxious about being around other people. So I wanted to actually pose that to you, but also to all the panel. And um, I wanted to hear, you know, from, from Jim and from Tom too, as, as someone who's, you know, had, you know, serious medical problems. There's, so one of the most interesting things that I've studied over the course of my career has been anxiety. And I've looked at that not only in people who are, have an identified disorder, but people who have other primary disorders and how anxiety amplifies their symptoms or changes their symptoms. Because without any anxiety, we do not do well. In a pandemic, we don't pay attention to physical and medical recommendations for safety for ourselves or others. But literally crossing the street, if you don't have anxiety, you don't notice the traffic. Um, so anxiety, you don't take your hand away from the hot stove. You need anxiety to function. Too much anxiety, like for animals that pa get paralyzed, paralyzes our ability to respond or react. And what we need to understand is how to change the over generalization of feeling ang anxious and, apply and then apply it to every situation, like a person in the throes of a post-traumatic stress disorder where they overreact to everything and start developing a more discerning eye and response to whether or not the level of anxiety is appropriate to the situation. Does it increase our attention so that we then look at risk and benefit and make a reasonable choice? Or does it prevent us from making a decision so we procrastinate, so then we have consequences of the lack of a decision being our decision? And so, yeah, the grocery store is a great place to be anxious because you're not in control of all of those people, but also controlling your environment does not fully protect you from everything else. It doesn't necessarily have to be bad, but it could lead you to be so isolated that you're not taking care of yourself.
There seemed to be some kind of a glitch going on. Yeah, there's a glitch. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right, we're back. Technical stuff. We were talking about that before we even started, right? Oh boy. So let me actually. That has your pulse, right? <laughs> there you go. Wait, anxiety. Just... <laughs> there's my anxiety, like, oh, what just happened? Um, uh, but I wanted to ask both Jim and Tom about um, yeah. how to manage. So here we are in this time, and you know, Jim is still dealing with with cancer and and treatments and, and having to monitor that, and and Tom has to really be careful too about although you, you Tom you're talking about you push yourself you know because you're driven by the the the, uh, the desire to take care of your family but there's still anxiety here so I think for those who are attending this um, I think it'd be helpful to hear from your perspective how do you manage your anxiety around trying to get out there do more things um, but you're also aware as you are, that now they're increasing cases of COVID. So maybe you want to start, Jim? Sure. I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean if you want to manage your anxiety, run the Vermont Department of Corrections. And I say that kiddingly. Um, I, I, I learned more about COVID. I mean, I, I, I'm in charge of six jails spread over the state where, um, I mean, today, um, a positive incarcerated individual. Uh, I understand contact tracing. I understand exposure. Um, I, I understand the disease better than I ever did. So it helps me personally better be able to manage my anxiety around it because I've been dealing with this now for 18 months in a jail system um, where I'm proud to say we're the only state in the country that hasn't lost an incarcerated individual to the disease. Um, so it helps me better understand the virus and it helps me manage my anxiety, but that doesn't mean that I don't get anxious around, you know, should I go to church this week? Um, you know, do we take the risk? Kim and I were on vacation last week, probably for the first time we went inside restaurants, but we took calculated risks around that. Mm. We both, understand the virus and the exposure um, very well. Um, Kim being a, a nurse and uh, me running a jail system. So I don't know if that answers the question or not, Bertie, but, but it helps me better manage my anxiety, having a better understanding of the virus, but also having a really good understanding of my health issues as a result of, we'll get to eventually here, right? Communicating with my healthcare providers and asking the right questions about my health to better understand that and match that up with what we now know up to this point about the virus to include the variant. So that's how I manage it. And, and you know, Kim and I have to have, a, have a, an agreement that we listen to each other about what our concerns are if we're going to do something. Um, and it's kind of a standard joke when we leave the house, do you have your mask? Yes, yes, I have my mask. So, I mean, that's that's how I manage. That's how I manage the anxiety. It really brings me back to what you were talking about, Dr. Reeve, and that is, you know, anxiety serves a constructive purpose. It could obviously get out of control and be debilitating, right? But it, it really does. And you're talking about that, Jim. It's like you're, you're constantly weighing, you know, because there is anxiety. It's generated because you have to be careful, but you're constantly weighing your choices. Mm -hmm. uh, what to do, who to speak to about what to do. So, I mean, curious of Tom, in terms of you, you know, how do you manage your anxiety? You know, you work out a lot, you try to, you know, keep that under, under, under control. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the ways you manage anxiety coming off of having this serious case of COVID? The biggest thing <clears throat> that I'm noticing today is employees how to keep them safe. I mean, we're in a really troubled market right now, and I don't know how you realize it. We can't find people, you can't find technicians, but you gotta make people want, don't know if they wanna come back to work because you gotta provide a safe environment. I mean, New York State is under a Heroes Act right at the moment. We're all wearing masks right at the moment. Um, we make our employees wear masks. And, you know, I, I was out in the cold um, yesterday and I'm thinking to myself, 
cold, that, that could go to pneumonia again. So you're always thinking this stuff. I mean, when you have as many employees, and, and Jim, I hire a lot of people from the corrections department, and when they get when they get uh, symptoms, I had one yesterday, he had symptoms. Go back to the facility. I, mean, I got to protect. You have all your employees you have to protect. Our HR department right now is out. They're out of the building. They're sick. They have this, they have the COVID. It's not going away. It's still there. So how do you make yourself safe? You condition yourself, but you got to be cognizant of everybody's mood coming in. You have to make a safe environment where people don't want to come back to work. They're afraid. They're people. I think when you look at people, there's such a tense moment right at the moment that you've been through that it, it's hard to get people. And that's what I'm going with. I know that I'll get myself going and keep going, but I worry about my employees. I have a, an employee right now that he has to go and have scar tissue removed from his lungs because he had COVID so bad. I'm like, no kidding. You just told me this tonight. It's like, how's that? There's sick people. That people had it bad. I mean, so it's not going away. I mean, we have winter coming up and hang on because we do not have it under control. I don't believe it because now you got the other fear too. Hey, my employer may, might make me get a vaccination. Wait a minute. The people with vaccinations just don't getting sick too. So you got people fearful of everything. What your employee's going to do, your employer's going to do. And it's like, what do you do? People have rights and I don't know. If you're, if you're worried about my employees. That's but you, this is what you're talking about. And this is actually very relevant because you're talking about the people that you're surrounded with. Mm -hmm. how they impact your own anxiety, your own worries, your own fears, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. you're trying to manage, you have a big, you know, big job, right? Mm -hmm. uh, managing a lot. Worry of about them. I worry yeah. about them. And, and how in, in turn that impacts you, in mm -hmm. your own anxiety level. So it's, it's reciprocal in that way. You know, yeah. Hoping that, you know, that they take better care of themselves and in turn you would be safer. But it's it's a real it's a balancing act we're talking about. You know, uh, Colonel Baker is talking about the same thing. Um, any other thoughts, Sarah, that you have about this 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 subject? I mean, I think the environment that I live and work in, and the community. Uh, I I mean, I personally deal with stress by going outside, mm -hmm. fresh air, and actually being alone. <laughs> with with my work, I I. I regenerate my energy by, by being by myself walking in the woods. So that's my own personal and anxiety. Like what I was saying before is a common thread with individuals dealing with cancer and their family members. So we, uh, you know, treat a lot of anxiety with medications temporarily, but we talk a lot about how they feel. And I think that is very therapeutic. So what you're saying is so important because it's not just cancer. You know, Dr. Eve, of course, is a psychiatrist, talk about mental health issues, problems, people who are really struggling with those things. Um, but, you know, really, we're talking also about whether it's cancer, other kinds of very serious illnesses. It's like it's the same kind of issues that arise. You know, how do I manage this? And I, I think what I'm hearing, and I, I think I hear, I hear it, is that there really needs to be a weighing going on. It's not black and white thinking. Um, and so uh, maybe I'll ask Dr. Reeve to talk a little bit more about that in terms of- So, so I, I think that that's part of it. I think also there are different um, useful and not useful responses to anxiety and to discussions. One of the things I was thinking about as Sarah was talking is that just talking about it can amplify anxiety. There are people who don't know how to take themselves out of the discussion loop into an, a safe action. What Jim was talking about is before you go into the restaurant or decide to go out, you weigh back and forth and then you choose an action. They don't spend the rest of the night, should we have gone to the restaurant? Should we have worn the mask? Should we have gotten takeout? Should, once the die is cast, you're on to the next moment. So one of the tricks of coping with anxiety is to realize that courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is recognizing the fear, but not being paralyzed by it. And 
Anxiety is useful only in the extent that it alerts you, allows you to bring your physiology to bear and choose a direction. And then in the next present moment or 10 present moments later, the situation may change and you have to reassess. And what Tom talked about having recorded himself moving from ICU to the step down unit before even getting home and not even recognizing his own voice, mm. recognizing that there was rehab required. He couldn't just go out and take a walk. His oxygen dropped too abruptly. It took adaptation. He was grateful, but he hasn't sat back in his armchair and said, oh, well, thank you very much. I got through that. I'm good to go. Look at my halo of the COVID survivor. No, he's back in the thick of it, having to cope with uncertainty of who is sick, who is not sick, who's got a sinus infection that is not COVID, who's got the flu. That's what we're all testing now. We're recommending especially people who are immunocompromised to get flu shots as well as vaccinations and booster shots. In our environment, we require employees all to be vaccinated. It's a small agency. We interact with people directly all the time. We are going to be their vectors. We want not only to minimize the intensity of infection we transmit to somebody, Inadvertently, we want people not to die or be in the ICU, but to get through an illness episode and be able to function. So we see that as a requirement for maintaining a healthy and safe workplace. So I think I touched on a lot of things, but our not useful anxious anxiety responses include spinning in place, include making a decision too rapidly and denying that we're anxious because we don't wanna face it. So if we don't label it, it doesn't exist. And so we get into in all of these patterns, ways in which we become reified or stuck in a certain kind of thinking. And what you were just saying at the, at, as I started talking was you have to weigh risks and benefits, different information. Your body language, my body language is not static. It was weighing back and forth. That's the whole point. It's not reified absolutes. Now there may be an absolute risk for people in certain times where they're not going to do something, but all the rest of their actions is where there's movement back and forth all the time. That, as you're talking about that, uh, Dr. Reeve, it makes me think about family. And I know it's been touched upon by, by both you know, Tom and Jim, um, in terms of when you find yourself, again, this notion of weighing and the people who are listening to this have family members who may not be weighing the risks and benefits may not be reaching out to healthcare providers who may be able to help them or encourage them to be thinking in this way. So I'm just wondering, this is really for everybody. You know, it's like, you know, how do you approach this? How do you, how are you helpful? And all of us want to be able to get back to normal life. You know, we, we want to get out there. And, and yet, as we're discussing today, I mean, it's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough decision that needs to be made. And sometimes we find people we really care about not really thinking through, not really weighing these risks and benefits. So, you know, could you I'll put this out to everybody, you know, your thoughts about how do you approach that? How do you um, try to address the people that you care about who are not doing what we're talking about right now? And there are many. So. Any thoughts, Jim? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I have some family members that that are close that are not vaccinated. Um, you know, and it's it's difficult to, to maneuver around that. Um, you know, and, 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 and then this whole discussion about how do you make decisions and how do you interact with family members? You know, there's so much misinformation out there. Um, 
you know, I, I'm just lucky to be where I am now to get information that I get all the time. I mean, I, I sit in an agency where Dr. Levine reports out three times a week to commissioners about the state of affairs in the state. I mean, I have that direct information and, and I process it, but I have family members that are operating off of very poor information. Um, and you try to encourage them and it, it, um, it does drive a wedge in because that's part of our decision-making process. If someone's not vaccinated, then how, how much time can we spend with them? Or yeah. what can the arrangement be? And for me personally, probably out of all of this, that's been probably one of the biggest challenges for me because we, we don't have that kind of normal uh, family contact that you had before. And it's, it's challenging and it makes the situation much more difficult to deal with. I mean, all the other stuff we talked about for me personally, the anxiety and how I balance that, I can work through all that, right? I'm much like Tom, I'm a, as you know, Bernie, I'm a, I'm a lap swimmer. And, you know, I, I, you know I, I'm looking forward to, do, you know, now that I'm finally over my medical stuff to get back in, I, I can burn up my energy there. But that- <laughs> And Jim, you're, t you're talking about the difference between the things you get to make decisions about personally right. versus the decisions right. other people are making that have a direct impact on you. Exactly right. That's the point I was getting to is that it, it, it is really difficult to deal with. I have no control over that. Right. And I've I have had some patients. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, it's frustrating. Yeah, I was just going to, I, a lot of, um, patients that feel very strongly about the vaccination and their own vulnerability seem to, when they have family members that don't feel the same way, are very hurt by it and take it personally. And it's a huge source of um, distress and confusing because I think for, at least in, in my experience, the cancer patient, it just seems so clear that they are so vulnerable. Why would you why would you do this to me is sort of how they feel. So I'm just, it sounds like that's, I'm sure what it feels like for you too. Exactly right, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Again, this is, the, the, we're using a lot of terminology like weighing and balancing. Um, and it takes that kind of thoughtfulness driven by anxiety to, to really think through what really is best and especially in this terms of this particular webinar, you know, people who are, have, are survivors or are continuing to face serious illness. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy and, you know, we're not, we don't have solutions, but I think what we're really talking about in this conversation is process. Yeah. Like what is the process? What do we need to be thinking about, thinking through and talking about uh, with the people that matter to us? Uh, talking about this to the healthcare providers who are there for us to give some guidance, you know. Um, and one of the questions I had, I, I asked you, uh, or I kind of indicated before the, the webinar, is to be thinking about, you know, like, so how do you uh, advise people to, um, uh, to approach their healthcare providers in terms of what their concerns are. I mean, um, it's just really about communication. And of course, a lot of our work, as, as you know, it's about communicating, uh, patients communicating with healthcare providers and vice versa. Um, so is there something that you would advise someone in terms of how to present this, how to communicate this, the issues you're concerned about? Again, it's, it's the risks, the benefits, um, to really widen the conversation. It, it probably happens, of course, at home with people who are close to you. And there's some, of course, like you're saying, Jim, who really are not interested. They really don't want to hear this, which is tremendously hurtful. And it, 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 you say it's, it's the wedge, it's the barrier. Um, but there's also the importance we rely on our healthcare providers. They're knowledgeable, you know, and, so, and they can have influence, uh, not only per se on you, <laughs> but maybe in fact, you can have it on the people who may be a little bit resistant or are not quite grasping. So I think, I think that's partially true, 
I think it also depends on how ready people are to hear another point of view. Um, there were two thoughts I had. One was a, a comment in response to what Sarah and Jim were saying, is that for many people, they are responding out of their sense of fear or choice or their reaction to the fear of the situation. And um, parenthetically, I had talked in part of the interviews about the idea of collective trauma. And that's part of where that fear response comes from because we've all been impacted by this uncertainty um, in different ways, but no one is not touched. Um, and so it, it feels personal when your family refuses to do something that makes getting together with you or with your patients. Um, but the person who's done that may not have done it against somebody else. They may have done it out of their attempt to protect themselves and their best way. Um, and um, Mike Welther has written two important comments in the general chat. And one of them is that this anxiety touches the fear of death. And especially at the beginning of the pandemic and before widespread vaccination, people were dying. And before we got remdesivir and other protocols and prone treatment of people in the ICU beds, we, people were dying at a much higher rate. And there was a real fear that if you went in the hospital, you weren't coming out. And that was reality-based. It was reality-based risk. And there still is an increased rate of death that vaccination has helped reduce. But as he also says, the healthcare expert, you know, <laughs> Colonel Baker is the head of this penal, overseeing this penal system, getting direct input from our medical director for the state who is very well informed and getting direct information from CDC, transmitting it to everybody, including primary care physicians and specialists like myself. And we have patients who don't think that we have access to real information. Their sources of information don't jive with that. And they're not sure that they believe those studies because they think the scientific method is biased. And so there are belief systems that are used to defend people against their uncertainty and anxiety that then are not subject to logical thought. Just like spiritual beliefs or religious beliefs are not subject to a debate style logical thought, it's a belief, it is a held belief. And so at some point you have to honor differences and find ways to move forward if there can be conversation and compromise without putting people at unacceptable risk. And that's yet another point at which you have to weigh risks and benefit and how to move forward. And there's a quick thing saying, can I speak to, can we speak to anger as opposed to anxiety? Anger is often driven by anxiety. One of the things that is uncomfortable about fe feeling anxious is you feel very vulnerable and the best protection is to be angry and be offensive to protect yourself. And that's just a really nutshell response, but it, it it's part of that reaction, brittleness, the stress of not being able to tolerate uncertainty. So it's easier to be angry or it's easier. And I don't mean easy in the sense of sitting in a lady boy chair. I mean, psychologically, you take away the uncertainty by making a definitive choice. And it's so fast that often people are not consciously aware that that's what they're doing. That's where treatment and support and conversation can help people switch their points of view. I'm talking way too much, sorry. No, you're talking about something that we had discussed before, which is this whole notion of all of us, this collective trouble, all of us are experiencing this. And then and my, my question was, and you really addressed it, it's like, how do you try to heal from this? You know, what do you do? And like, there's no you know, specific absolute answers. And I come back to the word 
process, the ability to keep conversations open uh, and bring some more information in, which might be rejected, but then again, it may not be rejected. Um, because if we're talking about living fully, it's not just about activity. It's about an emotional sense of satisfaction, of connection. And when that, because of a lot of this stuff that we're now talking about, uh, where there's um, resistance differences about you know, how, how serious this COVID thing is really about, um, it, it really splinters um, a lot of relationships. And so there's this emotional piece about living fully. And, you know, uh, you would hope that somehow in conversation with, when there's differences, that, that that heartache, that sadness, those feelings, and perhaps the anger is there too, of course, um, can be part of a conversation to try to move this aspect of living more fully, the emotional side of things, not just the activity side of things, being able to move that forward. And I suspect, you know, um, again, as whether you're on the, on the patient side of it, whether you're on the healthcare professional side of it, these are things that come come up all the time. I think I think of you, Tom, in, in your dealership, you know, of people who, you know, may not really share similar views about the seriousness of this, you know, and you, know, you can give them information, but it's also, you know, here's someone who's gone through this and for them to be able to appreciate what it's been like for you, you know, and maybe that can make some headway, maybe, but, you know, it's, it's, I, I put this in this, this category of, you know, how do we go about trying to live more fully in, in, on, on many different levels? You know, there's the protection, there's because you're, you're, you're ill, whether you're a cancer patient, or whether you have other uh, illnesses, serious illnesses, you know, you always have to be thinking about this on more than one level. Because, you know, what you do, what you say is impacting other people. And you would only hope that they understand, thinking you, Tom, and you and your 400 employees in your dealership. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure the gym and your in your work situation with the you know correction system. You know, um, you you want we all want to be able to get there, um, but it takes these kinds of conversations, quite frankly, and that's why we do these webinars. And we hope that people are, are listen to it and um, take stock of what you're sharing about your own experiences in terms of what it takes, you know, the, the thoughtfulness that it requires to be able to think about and then plan carefully, you know, what it, what it means to me to live more fully, what it means to my loved one to live more fully. So this to me, I mean, I am so um, appreciative of, of what, you know, you're sharing with us because this is a very um, delicate subject. People really react, but everyone wants to be able to move forward with their lives. But there's ways of going about it that are thoughtful. Mm -hmm. There are ways that are going about it that can be very foolish and harmful. So I hope that, um, you know, I realize we're, we're kind of getting low uh, out of time here, but um, that I hope the people who are attending kind of really are taking in what you're sharing because it's such rich and important information. Um, and I want to thank you all as a panel for, for, you know, participating tonight and really giving of yourselves uh, mm -hmm. and, like I say, sharing your expertise uh, and sharing your knowledge. And a lot of it's self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, so um, as we're kind of running down on time now, and we're going really to try to be careful about sticking with the time of the webinar, um, it's, I also would like to take a moment here to extend a, a, a special thanks to the people, the sponsors, who have helped to uh, make this program possible. And we have a list and I'm going to take a moment and I'm gonna read the list because these people really um, are, are very supportive of our work and they wanna see it continuing and reaching more people. So we have the Bennington County Medical Society, Bennington Physical Therapy, DB, DB McKenna and Company, the Paula Auto Group, which is Tom's Company, GBH Studio, Husik Tire Services, Husik Falls Country Club, Jason Morrissey, attorney, 
Jerome Construction, the Keelan Family Foundation, who's been very generous, as have Michael Keene, Edie Sawitsky, People's United Bank, the Richards Group, Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, and Williams Financial. So I really wanted to say that out loud because it really makes a difference to us. And if anyone is interested and wants to see uh, or support more of these programs, you're welcome to donate online at speaksooner.org. Always put that plug in there. Um, just some last comments as we're finishing up. Um, I hope it's been informative, of course. Uh, if you're interested in future programs, you just have to sign up at speaksooner.org. You could read Celia's blog, A Medical Humanist Notes as well. And for you who are not familiar um, with the guide we've developed, it's, uh, it's called Speak Sooner, A Patient's Guide to Difficult Conversations. And it's specifically developed by us to help patients um, identify their questions and concerns uh, in preparing for their visits with their healthcare providers. So it could be extremely valuable tool. Uh, there will be a survey afterwards and we hope you complete the survey because uh, we ask you uh, not only your feedback, but if there are subjects that you would like us to cover in future webinars, please let us know. Um, every attendee will get a, a link to this recording. Um, even when I blanked out for the one moment, you'll see that again. Um, and um, if you uh, want to let others know who did not attend, that this recording will be streamed at speaksooner.org, which is our, our website. Um, and one last reminder that our mission is to improve healthcare communication. And we must keep in mind that doctors and nurses are not mind readers. So that patients, we have to be able to be prepared to open up channels of communication. And that is really the, the emphasis of the work that we've been doing for now 20 years. It is really about the patients and educating them to open up these sometimes difficult conversations. Um, and finally, uh, I just wanna let you know that we're so appreciative of all you who have attended this evening and we look forward to you um, attending future programs. Um, uh, like I say, sign up at speaksooner.org and you'll be notified about all the programs that are, are coming. Um, and I appreciate you attending and again to the panel, Thank you so much. I really, you've been fantastic. Um, and I hope to see all of you again. And please stay safe.